Space enthusiasts everywhere, it is time for the angry astronaut to put his reputation and his literal ass on the line. How am I doing this? Well, it's part of the Angry Astronaut 100K Challenge. And yeah, they do these challenges on YouTube all the time. I don't even know if this really should be called a challenge, but it doesn't really matter because what I'm saying in this video is going to generate a lot of controversy, a lot of haters, but I'm hoping a lot of viewers as well, because I believe the Starship being the most powerful, the most ambitious rocket in human history is not going to take off, not going to carry out a successful orbital launch as quickly as we would like to think. And I also believe that the Vulcan Centaur, which has been in development for quite some time, has reached a high level of maturity and has made a commitment to launch by the end of the year, is going to reach the moon or at least its payload is going to reach the moon before Starship can carry out a successful orbital test. What do I mean by all of this? Well, first of all, let's talk about what's at stake. First of all, I need to get to 100,000 subscribers. I know I can do that because I have at least 160,000 return viewers. If only a fraction of you decide to subscribe, I can get to 100K very easily. There has to be something in this for the channel, so that's the first part. The second part, Vulcan Centaur will need to carry out its mission to the moon, deliver Peregrine to the moon, before Starship carries out what I call a successful orbital mission. And by successful, it needs to reach orbit. And then the orbiter, that is to say Starship, needs to at least attempt a re-entry. It needs to reach the ground. I'm not saying it needs to land successfully. It just needs to get there. If it manages to carry out all of this before Vulcan Centaur delivers Peregrine to the lunar surface, surface, I will tattoo SpaceX fanboy on my butt. So first of all, let me make one thing abundantly clear. This is not the angry astronaut dissing on Starship or feeling that SpaceX is not as good as ULA or anything along those lines. I like Starship. I feel that Starship is going to be the future of mankind's exploration of the solar system. It is the only rocket that's currently in development that can actually carry this task out not SLS, not New Glenn, no other heavy launch vehicle is going to be able to affordably and efficiently explore the solar system on a large scale other than Starship. The whole idea behind Starship is brilliant. It's 100% reusability is something that every rocket company should strive for. However, that having been said, it's because I respect Starship so much and its ambitious plan that has led me to believe that it's not going to be able to carry out its first orbital mission successfully before the Vulcan Centaur can complete its mission. And to further clarify, this challenge has nothing to do with some sort of newfound faith in Blue Origin. What they've done with the BE-4 and the comedy of errors that have led them to deliver these engines five years late is simply unacceptable. It's put ULA in an untenable position. However, I believe also that Jeff Bezos, now that he has made a massive 
massive multi-billion dollar commitment to get the Kuiper constellation into orbit utilizing Vulcan Centaur is going to be sufficient incentive for him to make sure that these engines are delivered on time as rapidly as possible actually and that they work and he's going to invest as much money as is necessary to get the engineering talent to assure this and a recent photograph posted by Tori Bruno has added to my level of confidence on this matter. These are the flight certified engines under construction that will be delivered to ULA this summer. Obviously, they're not flight certified yet because they haven't been built, but these are the engines that will propel Vulcan Centaur out to the moon, or rather the Peregrine Lander if you want to split hairs. But another thing to keep in mind is the amount of time and effort that ULA has put into the development of this rocket. Keep in mind that the Vulcan Vulcan Centaur was first conceptualized back in 2013, so this is a nine-year turnaround time from ULA deciding let's go ahead and build a new rocket to the actual flight of this rocket. That actually isn't very bad. It's a pretty decent turnaround time. I mean, compare that to SLS, for example. That having been the case, this rocket also would have launched, in my opinion, a few months ago at the latest if the BE-4s had been delivered on time. So ULA has done a fairly decent job of delivering a new rocket that is admittedly based on the Atlas V, but nevertheless includes all kinds of new materials, all kinds of new technology, plus the capability for reuse, not only on the engines, but also on the Centaur upper stage. Now that obviously doesn't exist yet, but still the fact that this rocket was built with those sorts of factors in mind indicates to me that ULA understands the competition that SpaceX represents and the danger that they represent to the future of their company. And instead of relying on lobbyists and old boy relationships that they've had with NASA, because after all, ULA has launched missions to every planet in the solar system, something that SpaceX definitely has not done. So they could have relied on their laurels and their reliability, but they didn't. Instead, they are embracing innovation, embracing reusability, admittedly, not yet, but still, this is the first important step to catapult ULA into a whole new level of competitiveness. And that's something that I very much respect. But also, nine years, nine years. Think about what SpaceX was doing back in 2014. The first successful landing of a Falcon 9 booster didn't take place until December 21st, 2015. And the first Falcon 9 booster didn't land on a ship until April 8th of 2016. So it's only recently that Falcon 9 has been able to achieve this virtuoso level of success that they've had lately. I mean, the launch of a Falcon 9 and the successful recovery of a booster has become such a routine thing that virtually nobody except SpaceX fans pays attention to it anymore, especially nobody in the general public. And this really pisses me off because for many years, very, very intelligent people said that all of this was impossible, that there's no way that you could effectively get a rocket to land itself like like that and yet SpaceX makes it look easy these days. It is truly astonishing and I'm not going to take anything away from that and it's because this was such an amazing accomplishment that I believe that Starship and reusing Starship and successfully deploying Starship is going to be just as challenging if not worse. Now to be clear, I do not require Starship or the booster or whatever to make the challenge valid to have a successful landing because that's not built in to their first orbital launch plan. Instead, the booster simply has to have a successful soft water landing. That's all. So I'm giving SpaceX a lot of room here because, after all, Starship is an amazing, amazing achievement. However, 
ULA is achieving some amazing things with Vulcan Centaur as well, and I think they're going to achieve it on a quicker timetable, simply because they've had more time to do it, and also their ambitions are not quite as difficult. That having been said, I don't think that ULA is taking on an easy task at all. This is the first launch of a brand new rocket being propelled by brand new engines that have obviously had their problems. This is going to be an extreme challenge for the first use of a rocket like this. They're not sending something out to LEO or even geosynchronous orbit. They're sending something all the way to the moon, an ambitious mission that's supposed to have a soft landing on the moon. Now, again, to be 100% clear, if Vulcan Centaur gets Peregrine all the way to its destination and then Astro Robotic fails to land the Peregrine on the surface, something I find to be highly unlikely, by the way, given all of the talent that I met at that company, but still, it could happen. I don't regard that as a ULA failure. That won't put them out of the running as far as the challenge is concerned. However, on the other side of the equation, if SpaceX carries out an orbital flight and successfully lands Starship on its destination, at its destination, rather, off the coast of Hawaii, then SpaceX will win the challenge. So there's going to be a lot of unknown factors in this, and probably a lot of nail-biting on my part as the Peregrine mission continues, unless SpaceX manages to carry out their orbital flight a lot earlier than I think they're going to, then it's just going to be time for humiliation, which I can deal with. So once again, to be perfectly clear, if Vulcan Centaur and Astrobotic completes their mission successfully before SpaceX gets Starship successfully into orbit, then Vulcan wins either way. If Vulcan Centaur delivers Peregrine to the moon, but it doesn't land successfully, but Starship does land successfully off the coast of Hawaii, then SpaceX wins regardless of the timing. So there is your challenge, but let's keep Keep talking about why I think this is the case and why I think Starship is not going to be able to carry out a far simpler mission, that is to say just going to LEO and completing just less than one orbit. The first and perhaps most important factor is the issue with the Raptor 2. I'm not convinced that this engine is ready to go yet. Recent tests of the Raptor 2 carried out in Boca Chica have demonstrated this telltale green color associated with it. And I can't show you photos of the actual test because they were taken by somebody else and I haven't asked their permission to take it. But go online, you'll be able to find it pretty easily. Raptor 1 has proven itself to be a very effective flight-worthy engine. However, Raptor 2 has had issues or at least least seems to be having issues, so much so that Elon Musk took over the production of Raptor 2 personally not that long ago. So I'm not entirely certain that Raptor 2 is ready to carry such a massive rocket into space anyway, especially if we're talking about 30 plus engines on the booster and six engines on the Starship itself. That's going to be a very challenging undertaking for a brand new engine that, in my opinion, has not been fully proven or tested yet. Keep in mind that a full-flow staged combustion engine is not an easy thing to design, and the Raptor 2 is a complete redesign of the engine on just about every level. The turbo machinery, the chamber, nozzle, electronics, all of these things have been redesigned. Obviously, what's been created is something that's far more straightforward. It appears to be far simpler and therefore far easier to work on and perhaps 
more inclined to be reused, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be able to use this thing quickly. It doesn't mean that this redesign is something that could be implemented and put into flight in such a short order. I mean, imagine for a moment that the BE-4 wasn't looking very promising and Blue Origin was going to come out with the BE-5 or the BE-4B. How many years would we expect that to take? Granted, SpaceX does things far faster, but this is something being done at a ridiculous pace. And so far, I don't think the Raptor 2 has demonstrated that it's quite ready for flight yet. Now, could it fly this year? Yeah, possibly. But also, I think it's equally possible that it could use a lot more work before we put more than 30 of these engines on a booster and six of them on the upper stage. I think that that alone is going to make it challenging to say nothing of all the extensive redesigns and all the testing that needs to be done to ensure that all of these redesigns are performing to expectation. We must also remember that although Starship has been stacked officially, it has not been stacked fully fueled, and a fully fueled Starship is going to be a monster on a lot of levels. The top stage, that is to say Starship, weighs 100 tons, yeah, but on top of that, you're looking at 1,200 tons worth of fuel. And on top of that, assuming that it has cargo, 100 tons worth of cargo. So 1,400 tons worth of mass on top of the booster needs to be carried to a sufficient altitude before the two can separate. We have no idea if this is going to work successfully. Sure, we can do all the mathematical models that we want, but we don't know if this stainless steel structure is truly going to hold up under the weight and the stress of this kind of launch. Nothing like this has ever been attempted before. I have every confidence that SpaceX will be successful eventually, but to expect them to get this thing off the ground in the few months that remain before the FAA gives approval, and by the way, there are indications that the FAA may be giving their approval soon, I think that we are fooling ourselves thinking that this is going to be an easy process. It just isn't. But unfortunately, one of the biggest issues that may put Starship's future into question, and I'm not talking about the it won't succeed or anything, but I think it may be delayed, is the fact that Elon Musk, in my view, has taken his eye off the ball. He has engaged in a political shitstorm by getting involved with the whole Twitter controversy buying the company in the first place for $44 billion in order to legitimize free speech. Well, I can't say that I'm opposed to that. Who would be? But unfortunately, recently, Elon Musk has made a number of statements, and I'm not going to say what they were. I'm not going to comment about what they contained or any of the political ramifications. I just That's just not within the scope of what I do on this channel. But they have put Elon Musk in the crosshairs of a major political debate. There's going to be people who hate him because of what he's done, and there's going to be people who love him for what he's done, and none of it has to do with space flight. But I'll tell you, it's going to be a major distraction for Elon Musk becoming the head of SpaceX and the guy leading the charge for us to go to Mars to a major and controversial political figure. Elon Musk has in a few days gone from a visionary who wants humanity to become a multi-planetary civilization in order to save our future into a guy who's allowing conspiracy stories to run rampant on Twitter. And once again, I'm not saying that's what he's actually doing, but I guarantee you he's going to be branded for things like that. And under that kind of attack and under that kind of scrutiny, 
I don't see how he can stay completely focused on the other things that exist in his life. And there's a lot of them, from Tesla to Starship to everything else. Whereas Tori Bruno is completely focused on Vulcan Centaur and its success. That's all this guy is focused on. And I think that he's an extremely qualified individual to determine whether or not Vulcan Centaur will fly by the end of this year. I don't think he'd be making the kind of statements that he has if he wasn't completely sure. And I'm feeling very confident that Vulcan Centaur will indeed fly in the fourth quarter of 2022, whereas I'm not as confident about SpaceX. Now, once again, I'm not coming out and criticizing SpaceX or saying bad mouthing them or anything along those lines. I do feel that Elon may have stretched things a little far with his recent decision, and that could put his ambitions at SpaceX out of his focus for a while, and that isn't a good thing. But that having been said, I still think that they will accomplish amazing things in private space flight, things that no other company will. So the chips are down. The bets need to be placed. Subscribe to this channel if you want to see SpaceX fanboy get put on my moon. If you are completely confident that SpaceX is going to reach orbit with Starship before ULA can get to the moon. So until either of those things happen, I urge all of you to stay angry about space. <laughs>